you with that. Uh, Chris, do we have you on the line yet? Caller, are you there? I am here. Caller, you are there. Uh, Chris, I'm going to go ahead and spotlight your video. Chris, right. let's talk. Uh, I see you. Here, let's talk Airtable. Let's talk Airtable. So, you know, it's kind of a, a hard act to follow up. Uh, Shay, you did a great job as track one chair. Thank you so much. And the first hour was great. I mean, that was a lot of cool content. It's really cool to see other people's way they do things. So we're going to kick off track two here. And we have this track is about um, just taking Airtable a little bit further. Um, you know, we're going to, some people are going to demonstrate automations or using other outside apps with Airtable. So we're going to start with William and William is going to demonstrate how to use a customer portal software called Stacker. It's, um, I played with it myself. It's really fun. And uh, what Stacker does is it, it helps really highlight data and it, and it gives you a, a user interface for people that you're going to be interacting with. And let's see, William, are you around? I'm still trying to find my way through Zoom here. I'm here. Uh, you, All right, William. Yeah, but hey. you, it helps, uh, Chris, it helps if you say caller, are you there? The caller, caller, please. The, call, the yeah. caller is here. All right, calling from, Cincinnati, calling from Cincinnati, are you with us? Okay. <laughs> calling from Dallas, Texas. All right, well, William, if you're ready, you can um, go ahead and start. Chris, I'm not sure how to spotlight someone. I don't even know if I have that control. There I am. Oh my God, that was frightening. Okay, now I'm now I'm gone again. I'm getting a warning saying Avi Phillips has entered the. Okay, oh, okay, great. All right. Yeah, let me. Yeah, William, I think you're you're in host mode now, so you are going to see some notifications. But we see you up on the presenter screen right now. Oh, you see me. Yes. Okay. Um, if I go to share screen, am I going to see? Okay, there, there I go. Okay, yeah, excellent. you share the screen, and it should. Okay. Sh yeah. I'm just waiting to see if I stay on on the screen here. Okay, good. Let me get started. My name is William Porter. I'm in in Texas right now. I'm the owner of a company called Rucksack Technology. Uh, I've I'm coming from a very different place than a lot of a lot of the people who are probably attending this conference, at least. I've been, first of all, I've been doing this for a very long time. Um, I'm in the past, I've built database management systems that have millions of records in them, thousands and thousands of lines of code. Uh, in the last 15 years, 10 to 15 years, most of my clients are law firms that do large litigation with, with lots of clients and they have lots of data to handle. But some years ago, well, five years ago, I wrote a review of Airtable for Macworld Magazine. And I'd been doing a lot of writing for, for a long time before that. And Airtable was completely, completely blown me away. And I'm talking about, this was Airtable when it was still in diapers. This is five years ago. And uh, you, can, you can look it up, just Google William Porter Macworld Airtable and you can read the review. It's actually still got some valid points about what's good about Airtable. And I, uh, I started to think, you know, maybe I should do this. And around that same time, I had decided to pursue more lightweight solutions for my clients. I changed the name of my company to Rucksack. Or Rucksack sort of, my wife and I are big backpackers. We like to go camping and Rucksack allows you to, to take a, just what you need and get out into the wild with it. And that was what I wanted to start doing for my clients. And, uh, and so Airtable looked like it might work. Now I've been waiting for Airtable to come up and, and tempt me in a way that I couldn't uh, resist. And that's happened, I mean, in the last couple of years, it's gotten much better. Things have really exploded, like just last week um, with the, the additions to Airtable. And so I'm, I'm actually about to start my first client project in Airtable. I'm not gonna show you that because unfortunately, the data in that is lots of clients with confidential information. And uh, so I can't do that. So what I did is I took an example from my Airtable, from my Airtable review in Macworld. It's a house hunting database. And I built a demo based on that. Now the demo, ignore the content here. It doesn't really matter. I'm demoing what I can do. And let me switch and show you. Okay, how do I, let me show you my little Airtable app. 
Um, so here, here's my, here's an Airtable app. Now, if you're new to Airtable, you may, you may be looking at this and wondering what the heck is that? Well, I'm gonna tell you in a minute, but trust me, this is an Airtable app. This is Airtable data there. This is a house hunting database, so it's got properties in it that my wife and I wanted to go see. Here's, here's one, I click on it and I can see da data uh, about it. If I go back to this list, let me see, let me search for rating five. I'm now filtering and I'm looking at properties that we liked. Uh, so here was, here was one. Up here at the top now, I'm in a detail view. I've got the price and reviews when it was built info about the property in a box, some links that show the property on Zillow or in Google Maps. Um, down here, what my wife and I thought about it. And sometimes I have one photo, sometimes I have lots of photos after we go to visit the property. Um, I've got other things, I've got notes and some other stuff in here. These links can also be used to uh, show some other things. So for example, in here, when we set up on a, a viewing with the real estate agent, I want to put those on a calendar. So here's a link that shows me a calendar. There's a nice little calendar of things that we're going to go and view or have viewed. Um, I'm also able to get a view here that allows me to see a, all the data. And by going up here, now this should look familiar to you. I can download a C CSV and get all of my data out of this. So what is this? I, you know, this is not Airtable that you're looking at. Although again, I insist that the data is. What this is, is Stacker. What's Stacker? Stacker is not a database. Stacker is a front end builder. It's, it's like a mask. And when you use Stacker, Airtable becomes the back end. My clients, my law firm clients, unlike most of the people that are in the conference today, they don't have the thrill of wanting to get in and you know, mess with tables and defining fields and creating their own. They want somebody to come in and do it for them. And so my clients don't, don't have access to the Airtable or the users of this, uh, this app, this portal, wouldn't have access to Airtable. They would be only working in Stacker. So it's a front end builder. Now, it does a lot. I'm gonna just go through real quickly some of its advantages. How do you use it? It's, it's really very easy to set up. You build your base and air table. So let me go over to the base and air table. Here's the base and air table. And you can see up here, we've got addresses, notes, some other things. When you build your base and air table, you need to make sure that you add users. And here's some gummy users. These are all basically versions of myself, but there could be hundreds of users here. And when I deploy this for my clients, there very well may be put in a name and an email address, and that's going to help uh, get people into your Stacker portal. But otherwise, this is a, a typical Airtable base with tables, relationships, fields, formulas. It can even have automations in it. Uh, I've got one here I've been working on to delete a property, uh, some other things. So all of this stuff is in Airtable. Then I get my API from my Airtable profile, and I go back to Stacker, and I'm not going to do this, so you just have to take my word. But when you when you set this up, Airtable or Stacker will ask you what's your Airtable app API. You paste it in. It then goes to your Airtable account, finds your bases. You pick the base that you want to use as the back end for the app that the portal that you're about to build, and boom, you're done. Now you're in Stacker, and once you're in Stacker, you start building this user interface. Um, uh, um, I've lost my interface because of this stuff that keeps appearing at the top. So if I go back to, um, to addresses here. Sorry, and, William. <laughs> that's all right. That's all right. I, I'm, I'm figuring it out. So if I, uh, oh, part of the problem is I'm in full, full screen view. Let me do that. That'll help. So uh, here I'm in layout, layout mode and I can now, you can see I can set up the fields that I want. It's, you just build layouts. It's a little bit like building a website using something like Weebly or Squarespace or something like that. Many of you have probably done things like that. So uh, at this point, you're going to just stay in Stacker 
unless you need to add a table or a field or change something in Airtable, then you as developer would go back to your Airtable account and make those changes and resync the database with uh, Stacker. But otherwise, from this point on, you're building your portal in Stacker. Now, what are the pros and cons of this? So we've seen already some really lovely uh, bases that stayed in Airtable. And I've done that for years myself. I have some solutions that I'm all, everything is in Airtable. For the most part though, they don't, they're not multi-user apps, at least mine aren't. Here are the pros and cons. There's one big con with Stacker and it's really not that big if you're like me. This, the, the big con is that Stacker is a separate service and it's not free. And if you only have a few users, Stacker is probably not cost effective. But if you have lots of users and lots somewhere around seven to 10, I think Stacker really starts to make very good economic sense, then it's really not that expensive. But that's the big con, Stacker is not free. There are lots of pros, at least for somebody like me. It allows me to build really nice attractive UIs that my uh, user interfaces that my clients are familiar with, lists and detail views and edit views, and it allows me to link to things and so on. There's no code involved. Now, the no code part of it is not necessarily a plus for me because I am getting used to the fact that I can't do some of the things I'm used to doing, but that's okay. That, in some ways, that's really good discipline for me. <laughs> Another thing that's fantastic about Stacker, and this is really what brought me to it, it's, it helps me with security issues. Now, remember, I'm dealing with lawsuits, lawyers, confidential information, and a lot of people that don't trust one another. So um, with Stacker, as I said, my users don't see the, the Airtable database. They only see what I give them in Stacker and they can't do anything with it except edit the data. Moreover, I can control completely who gets in and what they can do when they get in. They, I can control down to the level of what layouts they can see, what tables they can use. It's not just who's a creator, and who's an editor and who has read-only privileges. It's much more sophisticated than that. My users can't share with other users. Nobody gets into this thing unless I put them into the users table and then Stacker sends them an invite and they, they answer the invite and get in. Again, very important for dealing with confidential data. A final plus for me is that Stacker allows me to build solutions that are hugely multi-user. Stacker's default pro plan, the one that you pay, pay for, allows up to 500 users. Now, I won't get to that, I think, at least <laughs> not at the moment, but I have some of my solutions with 100 and more users right now. And with Stacker, that will be fantastic. If I can get those solutions translated to Stacker and Airtable, that will save my clients a, a lot of money and it will save me some time and uh, have a lot of other advantages as well. So no code, attractive user interfaces, much greater security, much greater user control, and hugely multi-user. Let me, let me conclude by saying Airtable this week, as it introduced these new uh, amazing new changes, talk, started to talk about itself as a platform. I'm not sure what they called themselves before because I think it's kind of been a platform for a long time, but I noticed this word platform appearing. A platform is like the foundation of everything else. So now, although Airtable's in the background here, that's a really important background. Everything else is gonna happen through Airtable. If I have automations, they're gonna run in Airtable, not in Stacker, although Stacker does allow you to do some custom coding. So there's a tremendous amount of potential here. And I wanna before, as I, as I wrap it up, I wanna say that although there is a cost for Stacker. I wanna point out something important. The cost only is incurred when you deploy your portal. So it's free to set up a Stacker account and try it out and you can build a complete solution. I'm not sure, sure that they mean for you to do this, but you could build a solution and use it yourself. And as long as you don't deploy it to somebody else, it's not gonna cost you anything. So if you are building solutions that maybe have many users, and where you need some greater control over the user interface or more security, give Stacker a try 
And uh, if you like it, then you know, you'll have decided that it's worth the money. But it's a great example of the way that Airtable now is really a very grown up platform for development. Very cool. Yeah. Yeah, that's how really do I stop sharing my screen, guys? There should be a little red button at the top that says stop. Sharing. Oh, there I am. Okay, thanks. I'm happy so, to William, answer questions. We had, we had a question. Questions. Yeah, William, we had a question. Um, someone asked, is this like a, a mobile app that someone downloads onto their device? No, Stacker is a service like Airtable. Uh, so I'm doing all my work on the computer, but just like Airtable, you can, uh, Stacker can be accessed on your phone or on any device because it's built um, to do this. So when I go to Stacker, I go to a website. It's stacker.app. It's not stacker.com. It's stacker.app. Sign up, log in, and you see a console with all of the, the projects that you're working on, the portals that you're working on. And after that, it automatically, it's, again, it's a bit like working in Weebly or Squarespace or, or any of these other website builders. It automatically redesigns the app so that it will work on your smartphone. So I've used this a little bit on my smartphone. Mostly I'm using it on my computer and my law firm clients will almost all be using it on computers. So I, I build the, the layouts with that in mind. Right, so would you say though that it's whenever you're building the layout that it, even if you like, you're mostly looking at the desktop view that it does translate really well to the mobile view? Yeah, I haven't tested it a great deal on my phone but I have looked at it on my phone and I thought it did a pretty good job. Um, it's, um, yes, yes, I think so. There is no, to my knowledge, there is no mobile app the way there is for Airtable. With Airtable, one of the things I mentioned in my old review is even in the early days, you could create an app from scratch on your phone. That's still the case, of course, with Airtable, and it's, and it's frankly pretty amazing. That's not the case with Stacker. You go to your, you got to do it on the website, but it does translate so you can make very mobile apps with Stacker, yes. Great. William, uh, Chris, I'm going to ask William something real quick because I, I can't miss an opportunity. So, William, you you wrote an article from Macworld, I think you said for Mac, some Mac yeah. site, uh, yeah, five Mac years World. ago. Mac yeah, World, so ma the ma major Mac publication. Yeah, so five years ago, you wrote this article from Macworld about Airtable. Right. And like me, you look like you might be over 40. Is, are you over 40? Oh. <laughs> yeah, Come on. yeah, I'm just, just slightly. Just I mean, slightly, okay. I'm I mean, just slightly I mean, late, over... Late, I'm in late, late middle age. Okay, there you go. Uh, uh, yeah, I know how it feels. So question, my question for you is, you, you've been around a bit. You've, you've written about tech. You wrote about this tech five years ago. What does Airtable look like in five years from now? Gosh, um, you know, unlike a lot of people, I, I, I worry about the future, but I, I'm, I have to be honest. I have no idea what, what things are going to look like in two months. Five years from now, she's. <laughs> uh, it's a terrific question, and because I'm thinking you've, about on, you've done this for a long time. This, I wish I knew. Yeah. I wish I knew. I think what I could say is that having watched Airtable grow for five years to the point where it is now, I feel confident enough about it. I, I'll just. I'm not, I'm not going to talk about what I what I normally use and have used for years, but my system's been around for decades. The the platform I've been developing in. And it's likely to be around. My, I wanted to feel confident before moving my clients to Airtable that they were going to be around. And I'm confident they're going to be around. Cool. And absolutely confident that it's going to keep getting better. Howie Lou seems to be fantastic. Um, so they're, they're doing a great job. Sorry, Chris. I couldn't pass up the opportunity. I'm like, no, no, no. He's seen everything. I wish I knew. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're like the, the Rip Van Winkle of database tech. Yeah, but I've, but I've made all, I've tried to make these predictions and all of my predictions are, are like <laughs> Bill Gates' famous prediction from the 1980s when he said, nobody's ever going to need more data than you can put on a floppy disk or maybe it was about the size of the processors. But, you know, all those predictions, even by people who know more than I do, uh, they're always wrong. So, cool. I don't know. Cool. Well, thanks, William. Uh, thanks. For there, yeah, definitely. So we're going to move on to our next speaker. We have Kuvan, and she's going to share with us how you can code in Airtable, even if you don't code. And 
I think a lot of people can use some of the things that she's been publishing and putting out there. And I personally have explored some of them to see if they work in my processes. Um, let's see if we can uh, give you a spotlight. You have, to say, you, have to say, you have to say, caller, are you there? <laughs> oh, man, I don't know. That's, I'll get it on I'm the here. last one probably. Caller, are you here? I'm here. All right. Hey, blue shirt. Blue shirt. Our table. <laughs> Okay, all right. So the title of my presentation is Adding Code to Airtable, Even If You Don't Code. The idea is, you know what? You don't actually have to be a coder in order to use code on it. Um, I'm actually probably one of the few people that fell in love with Airtable back when it was there who was thinking, oh my gosh, Airtable's perfect, except you can't do code. Um, Back then, if you used Airtable before this year, before 2020, you, you didn't have code really, not much, just a little bit with formulas. Um, but now I think that's one of the really huge changes is the Airtable used to be considered a no code platform, but it is not anymore. Uh, but even if you aren't already code or don't consider yourself to be a coder, don't be afraid of code. I spent the majority of my life thinking that I could never be a coder. I remember being in high school, being in my room, locked back and forth saying, I can't figure out how to write this code. I don't know. I'm going to fail this. And I didn't code for like years and years after that. I would dabble back. I thought, oh, I really wish I could do something. I just need to be able to code, so I can't do it. Uh, what actually <laughs> got me out of that was Airtable, was I dabbled with code before. Uh, when I got Airtable, that's when I said, you know what? Actually, I can do this. I can learn to code and I can write code and I can write some pretty good code. And it just opens up a whole new world. So let me go ahead and I won't actually be showing you any code in this presentation because I don't want to scare anyone, but I'm gonna show you all the different ways that you can add code to your Airtable base, even if you aren't ready to write that code yourself, okay? Um, my name is Kavon Vorderbruggen. That's Kavon with the K. It sounds like Yvonne and it has a silent E at the end. And my website is Kavon.com. It's such a weird name. Yes, I was actually able to get my first name.com. And it's new. Uh, I, I was taking Garrett's advice from the beginning. I actually said, you know what, I needed to register a domain name. And I was going on, on domain registers this morning, trying to get stuff finished up. So if it's a little bit rough, that's okay. Now, let me see. So here we go. So first of all, is why do you want to add code to your base? Because, you know, I mean, it's beautiful. And if you're afraid of code, but the thing is code can do some really great things. Not only can code form calculations. I mean, that's what we normally think of that. It can calculations on numbers and it can also do calculations on text as well. You can use it to automate repetitive tasks. You can do it for anything that's really tedious, like you have to do things over and over and over again, you just don't want to do that, have code do that for you. And that will also help you reduce human error. So the idea is, you know, when humans, when we do things, we get distracted, we figure out, oh, wait a minute, where were we? And then mistakes happen. So if you get code to do it, the code's going to do it the exact same way every time the way you told it. And the other thing that's really good about code is it can help you enforce some of the business rules on your database. Say you've got your database and you said, okay, you know, I, I've got a new, a new project that I want to do. And for every new project, I need to have these five different related records. And it's always going to have those five different related records. And it's a big pain if you have to do that all manually, because what if you forget to do all five? You forget the, to, to set the default value that Airtable doesn't set. When you add code, you can go over and have that for you. So you just click a button and all those five related records are created and instantly with the default values that you want. Okay. But the thing to remember is you don't actually have to write the code yourself in order to use the code because using code, you do that every single one of us uses code that we don't write. If you're using Airtable, you're using code that you didn't write. Okay. But Airtable really makes that bridge from writing, from just using code to writing code really simple. Okay. So let's take a look at all the different places where you can add code to an Airtable base. The first thing that I like to think of is formula fields. We look at formula fields, everyone's probably who's used much of Airtable, you've seen formula fields, there are little things you can add, numbers you can do, say math. Guess what, you know what? You're actually using code when you're writing a formula. You are using 
code to create that because that bit of calculation stuff, that didn't exist before. You were writing that. There's also roll-up fields that work very similar to formula fields, and I'll be going in depth into each of these later on. Um, roll-up fields, they're a little bit more complicated to understand than formula fields, but they're extremely powerful. And those existed way back since the beginning of Airtable. And then in February is when we got the first big way of adding new code. And that was the scripting block, as it was called back then. It's now, as of Monday, called the scripting app. But that lets you add completely custom code, opened up a whole new world of possibilities. Then or later on this year, we got automations that were added where you can run code automatically. Automations also have a lot of other really cool things too that I think some of our later speakers are going to describe, but you can run script as an automation. Then we have custom apps. You've, you've used Airtable and you've had that pro subscription and you've seen the different blocks that you could add, or they called apps now. Well, now anyone can go and create new apps all on their own and do that, build out that functionality that you just it wasn't there, it didn't exist before. You can build that out yourself. And then finally, there is the standard REST API, which used to be before 2020, the other main way of adding code, and which is kind of where I got started. But let's start with the simple stuff, formulas and roll-up fields, okay? So formulas are code. If you have written a formula, you have written code. You're using Airtable-specific functions and operators. If you've ever used something like the little and symbol to join two different text fields together, that is code. It's just using Airtable specific proprietary language. Okay, and then whenever you put in a field name, that's your variable. That's your code that you've been writing. The thing about formulas and roll-up fields is they calculate automatically. So that's one thing that's really nice about them. You, you don't have to go and say you don't push a button or run. Formulas are gonna work across a record Roll-up fields are going to go across linked records. So this is also one thing that people who are new to Airtable get really frustrated with, especially if they're coming from a spreadsheet point of view, is because they're like, oh, well, well, I can do this in Excel. I can do this in Google Sheets. How do I do it in Airtable? So that's one thing that you want to understand before you start writing any of those formulas in Airtable, that they do not work down columns. Uh, if you can see it here in the screen capture, you can see that formula fields, they can take multiple lines in there. Uh, let me see, that they can have more than one line. You can nest different formulas inside formulas. I've actually seen on the Airtable community forums, I have seen formulas that are 300 lines long. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, oh my gosh, if that's not code, I don't know what is. But it also can be something just really simple. It can just be a single, you know, a single line of, hey, I'm just going to add these two values together and see what's there. The one thing that I would recommend is if you do want to get into a multi-line formula, get a little bit better, is don't edit them in the, the editor that's built in there. Go ahead and open up a separate file where you can edit them in multi-lines and then you can just copy and paste it in. The next step up from writing formulas, if you feel like, oh, you know what, I've gotten comfortable writing formulas and then you can write a few more of them and you feel like, okay, you know, you can nest a few formulas and you, but you wanna do a little bit more Take a look at scripting app. Scripting app is different from the formulas in that formulas and roll they can only access that one record or all those records. The scripting app, it's got scope. It can do anything in the entire base. So it doesn't affect just that record that you're in. It can go in, it can create new records, link new records. It can go and delete, update data. It can even actually go out and pull things from the internet to go in and just grab more information. It's also different in that in order to run it, you have to click a button to run it. So there's a run button that you can click, or there is a, for the app, or you can also click the run button in the, uh, for the individual records to do that. They also allow you to have a little bit of user input when you run them. So you can say, okay, I wanna run this code, but I also need to grab this one number from the user, and then it can go out and do that. They are written in the JavaScript language. JavaScript is actually one of the most popular languages to learn right now. You don't actually have to use JavaScript or know anything about JavaScript to do it. You can just copy and paste another 
script that you found somewhere else and maybe just change a couple of things, you know, just to say this is the name of my base, these are the name of my fields. And then paste those in directly into um, the script editor in there. Or if you want to and you just find a base that's, excuse me, a script that has been written for you, um, some of them, there's a new feature that's been added just recently where you just go in and you throw in custom script settings and you never have to look at the code past typing it, past tape, pasting it into the editor. Next step up from the scripting app is scripting automations. So it's the same general idea as the scripting app where you can run code that can access any part of the base, but the idea is this runs automatically. So you don't actually have any user input. It's also written in JavaScript. It's also got an editor in there. And the idea there is you can also just copy and paste things in, maybe make a couple changes to say, oh, this is the name of my table. This is the name of my field. Set it up and have it run automatically. So it's still a fairly new feature. So um, I really recommend getting comfortable with the other methods of writing script or writing code before you jump into this. But the other thing that's nice is, you know, you can always have someone set it up for you. And then you can have an automation that does really complex things without having to pay an ongoing subscription to Zapier or Integromat or some other service. Okay. Then we get custom apps. So custom apps are not going to be for a newbie user to write. <laughs> but they are okay for newbie users to use. There is a new marketplace for custom apps. And I think Airtable is really, they announced this on Monday. They're really going to be pushing it out. And this means that anyone can be a developer and can create an app and put it out into the marketplace. And then you can download and use it just like you would go and say, you know what, I'm, I want a new app on my phone. And you can download that app and use it. And so there's all kinds of openings for, for custom development that can go out there. Uh, the picture that you see here is a custom app that I built uh, for creating a web post, um, a post to my website. I write the, the post, I develop it all, and I write it up all in my Airtable base. I click a button that says update that post or publish post, and then it gets pushed out to my website without me ever having to log into my website directly. So this one's like, it's a little bit trickier. You can't I, just go find some code online and copy and paste it in. I see you girls that can code. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm sorry. If people are in chat right now. I can't see it, but at the end, we'll have a Q&A for There's that. There's so much chat going on. You're doing good. <laughs> there Come is on. a lot. Okay. And also, that it's, it's written in React and stuff. The other thing about this is, really, it's a small step. You know, for, from formulas, you're like, oh, you know what? I think I can write a three or four line formula. I'm okay. Try scripting block. Scripting, but you're like, oh, I actually get that. And then you're like, oh, okay, but well, custom app development, it leverages so much of the same concepts that you learned in the scripting app that the next step up to learning how to build a custom block is actually not nearly as hard as you might think. Not nearly as hard. You have to know several different concepts, but the documentation that they provide and the examples that they provide are so well written that it's really easy to pick up once you've got that feeling you say you know if i want to invest the time in it that's one thing you can really go down some time suck rabbit holes with scripting and stuff like that it's fun but you, you can look up hours later and <laughs> now the last way of writing code is the scripting api it's the standard rest api this is actually what's different about this is you're not writing code for Airtable to run in your Airtable base. It means you've got some other app, some other website that wants to go reach into Airtable to get the information from there. And that's what the standard REST API is. And it has to be developed completely outside of Airtable. My recommendation, don't start here. Um, I did because at that time there was no scripting block. There was no of those intermissions, not of that. And I said, you know what? I love Airtable so much, even though I don't think of myself as a coder, I really, really, really want to use the standard REST API. Uh, extremely challenging. I find myself trying to learn HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and PHP, all at the same time as I had to reteach myself how to code in uh, Visual Basic to develop some access databases that I was working on. Don't do it. And don't try and learn multiple languages at the same time. Um, 
it's just crazy. It's insane. And you will drive yourself nuts. But Plus, I, 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 unlike that, you need standard rest. <laughs> yeah. So, but this is what it's like. I mean, the code that I actually see the screen capture, that was some of the code that I actually developed for that. And not for the fade art, but it is doable and the documentation is excellent. So here's just a quick overview of the different ways of adding code that you can do it. And I've ranked these from the easiest to use. You can do it. It's easy. Performing the fields are the, the easiest. Then a little bit more step up is roll up fields because they just have a different way of getting your mindset around how Airtable stores data. Then a little bit harder is the scripting app. A little bit harder than that is, cus is the scripting actions. And then if you've done that and you want to take that next jump, go ahead and look at the custom app development and maybe even the standard REST API. I can say I've actually done and worked and developed with all of these different methods and they are doable, they are learnable, just take it a little bit at a time. And it's also good to know about the differences among them because you need to know, you know, for example, which ones are going to run automatically, which ones do you click a button for, which ones are the ones where you can just copy and paste some text that you've gotten from someone else that you just trust. You say, you know what, I, I don't want to write this. I'm going to have my friend write this for me and then I'm just going to paste it in and you can get through that. And then I also plan on uh, posting these slides to my website. So okay. cool. Thank you so much. Come you on. want this more information? There's websites for learning how to code, where you can get code that's already been written for you, and where you can get help for it. Okay. And that's it. Is there any time for questions or did I go over? <laughs> we're a little uh, we're, we're yeah, a little, little tight. <laughs> but um, we will we'll try to do all the questions at the end. Uh, okay. of this block and then uh, we'll keep track of which ones. Kavan, how can people find you? They just they can Google just Kavan, K-U-O-V. -O. So my website is Kavan.com, K-U-O-V-O-N-N-E.com. Um, and okay. I think I'm the only one out there. Okay, thank you so much, Kavan, mind blowing. Yes, that was great stuff. Thank you so much for coming on. And let's keep the session rolling here. Next, we have Justin Barrett. I, I'm sorry, did I say your last name correctly? Uh, he's going to be going over Airtable automations, which is relatively new, but very, very powerful. And Airtable just seems to be adding new features to it every single day. Cool. Thank you. It's uh, Justin Barrett, but that's cool. Uh, I get it mixed up all the time. I get called Jason <laughs> half the time, so it's all good. <laughs> uh, anyway, Justin Barrett, that's my name. Um, I've been a narrative user for oh, about a year and a half, something like that, a little over that, but uh, I got hooked rather quickly and just dove in and just loved the platform and love everything about it. I thought at first I might have, okay, maybe two or three bases here and there, and I've got like 20 or 30 across seven different workspaces or whatever, so it's kind of nuts. Um, but the thing that I love doing the most with a lot of across a lot of things is helping people figure out and understand how Airtable operates. And that's the approach I'm going to take talking about the Airtable automation system today. So I do have a slideshow tied to this that was built about half an hour ago. So it feels like anyway, uh, let's get that launched. Um, okay. I have it back over here. Actually, let me, uh, let me do, 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 where am I going to share? Let me actually throw you back. Uh, so we'll pop into this. I'm not going to dive into the are you, base. Are you, right are you away. multi, are you multi screening? Um, multi, multi, multi windowing more like that. Okay. I have multiple <laughs> screens. Unfortunately, I kind of wish I did sometimes. You look like Tom, you look like a uh, Tom there from minority report per minute. Your eyes were going, like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> we got a real life cyborg on back here. A little too many things going on over here. We'll get back into this actual base here in a couple of seconds, but I want to start over here just talking about, again, just some of the basics of how this operates. Um, so the first thing is, what is an automation? How do you understand what an automation even is? I kind of broke it down into three different pieces here that the developers have also tried to make it very clear um, from their design as far as how they operate. So you have actions that you perform, actions primarily are gonna be on your base of possibly sending data out to other tools like Google um, services and things like that. Those actions are executed in a sequence. They try to remind you of what that sequence is be, via the design of the interface there. And it's all driven by a trigger. So each automation has a single trigger 
and that drives all the action that just run one, one after the other all the way to the end. Now, there's a little teaser I'll throw out there. I got a, some fun news at the end that was just kind of uh, posted to Twitter by one of the developers of the automation system not long ago. So talking about what's possibly coming up with automation, so really exciting stuff. But these are the basics as they exist for right now. So again, talking about the visual cues they added in there. So when you go and build a trigger, they want to make it visually understandable what it is when you're building this. So they, they kind of liken it to you know, pushing over dominoes. So as an icon, they're reminding you, the trigger is the first domino push that then chain reacts everything else after it. For the actions themselves, it's like the dominoes triggering, a, a, it's supposed to be a golf ball, I think, uh, falling into a hole there. And then to remind you of the order of the action, simple little arrows in the interface, they're going one to the next, to the next, and so forth. Uh, now, when I first got on board with automations, I was actually part of the original automations beta, early, early beta back in, I think, June or July, I forget when this was. And at that point, there were only two kinds of triggers available, when a record is created and when a record enters a view. You could do a lot with both of those triggers, but there was still some limitations there. Uh, and so, of course, they're continuing to work on the backside and they added a lot of the newer automation triggers in just the past like week or two, I think. And so now what you have are this number of things. And just this morning, or maybe yesterday, I forget when this was, they added these Google options you see over on the side. Uh, so these are now available as triggers to do even more elaborate things. But for the demo I'm doing today, I wanna to focus just on these four over here on the left that I'm calling the core four. These are things that can operate strictly within Airtable itself as far as triggers go, but they can then trigger as far as actions go, anything else you want from the possible list of actions, which is continuously growing all the time. So first one is when a record is created, obviously it triggers, maybe not obviously, immediately when a record is created. Now, some people think that they can create a new record and then possibly type some things into a field and have that picked up by the automation, but it won't do that. It literally fires the trigger once that record appears in Airtable. So for that to work, Whatever data you want to process in that record has to be in the record already. If it's not there, then the automation's not gonna pick it up. So this is best used in my experience anyway, uh, when you have things coming in from a form field. You can, not from a form field, but from a form of some kind. Yep. You can use this to do things that are done immediately if you have your base design so that certain information required by the trigger is there when the record is made uh, for example, with grouping. If you're grouping by uh, a linked field, for example, that link is automatically made in that group once you make the new record. And if that's needed by the automation, then it's got that to do the processing that it needs. Uh, so just be aware that record created as a trigger happens the moment that record is made. And so you gotta be kind of conscious of what your, what your record looks like at that point. The next trigger is when a record enters a view. This again is a second one of the two that were first available during the early beta phase. Now, um, this could be really useful because it can also trigger when a record re-enters a view. So it's not just a one-time deal like some other triggering systems operate with some of the third-party tools. So if a record enters a view because of some change you made to your record there, and then you change something else and leaves that view again, then later it comes back into the same view, it will re-trigger re a second time or a third time or whatever it happens to be. Now, early on, again, this was the only other option besides when record is created. And so when I was doing my initial testing, I found that I was making a lot of extra views just to trigger things through this system. But now we've got some of the newer triggers that operate based off of how views essentially operate. I'll talk about that in a second. So I find this more useful when you've already got views that you use for your workflow in some fashion. And then you want to do other things tied to those views, other operations on the records themselves. This is a great situation where a record entering one of those views can then trigger some of those secondary operations to go. Uh, so one of the newest ones, I guess the third one they added was when a record is updated. Now this also has an important caveat to be aware of here. This doesn't just trigger when a record is updated, but it also triggers when a record is created. And I have a little bit of a, a dispute, you might say, with how this operates. So effectively, a blank field, if you're targeting a certain field with this particular trigger, a blank empty field will still trigger the automation. 
Now, in some cases, that might not make that, that big of a difference, but in certain cases, it might actually mess some things up. So be aware that a brand new record with an empty field that's being monitored by an automation trigger will still trigger that automation. So um, again, it's a bit, a bit of a caveat there to know how that operates. Uh, and then the newest one of the top four anyway is when a record matches conditions. This is the one where originally I had built a bunch of extraneous views just to trigger certain animations via that view trigger. Well, now the record matches conditions, it pretty much has the same operations that you have when building a view in terms of filters. So, pardon me, all the, the filter options you have when building a view are the same options you have for the conditions when setting up this trigger. So you can say, when a certain field has certain values in it or when it's empty or when it's full or when dates are before or after certain things, all those options are in there. Uh, and you say, okay, I want to just set up these series of conditions and you have the and and the or operations in there as well. So uh, a great alternative to having to build lots of extra views that just serve to, you know, to uh, trigger automations. So once you've got your trigger figured out, and again, there are more of the Google triggers in there right now, but I'm focusing on just these top four. But once you have your trigger set up and built, then of course you got to figure out, okay, what actions am I going to do? And I'm going to dive over into uh, my base to show you how this sets up with one simple example here. So what I want to do in here, I've got a simple task system for assigning tasks to certain people. And what I want to have happen is I want a note to be added to my internal notes over here when I assign somebody and possibly through other things as well. I'll do the assignment uh, in this example. So I've got a people table over here with a bunch of individual people that I can assign tasks to. And so I want the automation to make a note in this field about the assignment when that happened. And then also send an email to that person. Hey, you have a new task. Here's what it is. Here's a link to the record where you can see more details about it and that kind of thing. And that will be driven by changing the status in my status field here. And the only options in here right now are pending, assigned, and complete. I could do more with a complete, you know, change later on possibly, but I'm focusing on just going from pending and changing that to assigned for right now. So on automations, I'm going to go create a brand new automation. And again, you see that lovely visual cue there. I'm going to call this uh, assigned task. And I'm going to choose a trigger. And again, we have all the options in here. What I want to do is when a record uh, matches condition, then I want to specifically look at the status field to see when that status changes to assigned. So I'm gonna say, I have to select a table, it's my task table. The condition I wanna add is when the status is assigned. And again, the same options you have in here as you do for setting up uh, a view filter. Now, before I can test this, testing is important because the data pulled from the record in your test then gets passed on to later actions that you're setting up. So I wanna make sure that I actually have valid data to test with in here. Now, behind the scenes, I'm also pulling in some other information. I have some other roll-up fields in here that grab details about that assigned person based on the link. So their first name and their email address, which I can then use in the automation. I also have a formula field that simply looks at the last modified time and formats that in a certain way. And I use that to insert as an add-on for my internal notes in here. But all it's kind of operating again behind the scenes for this stuff. So I need to make sure, first off, I have somebody assigned for this thing. So I'm gonna say I assigned it to John Smith and I want to test this uh, based off that assigned trigger setting. So when I run the test, it should tell me it's successful. So once that's done, I can drop this down and see all the details down here about that successfully tested record and what data came in from that thing. So when a trigger runs, it collects all the data from the triggering record at the time the trigger happened. Uh, and so everything is available in there, the assigned person, the status, all the field uh, data is available with certain limited exceptions. Uh, but I'll maybe talk about those a little later on. So uh, once I've got a test successful in here, um, the first thing I want to do is I'm just going to do one possible option in this thing for an action. I'm going to add an update to this field. So I want to update the record. So I have to choose again what table that record is being updated from. And I can update any record in any table if I want to as long as I have that record's ID. So I want to go to my task table. I pull the record ID from steps from pre any previous step in the automation. So you hit the plus over here to say what steps were there. 
and what data is available from those steps. So I'm in here from when my record matches a condition, that's my trigger. I continue to see what options are available in there. And I've got the record ID at the very top. So just click insert and that inserts that record ID as an entry for that option. Now I choose what field I want to update. So I want to update my internal notes field. I also don't want to make any changes to the contents of the note. I want to add to the note and that can actually be done pretty easily by just first off adding that note's contents from the trigger step as the first thing I add in here. So I can add from that same trigger step. I want my internal notes and I insert that. What I want to then do is add a new line. So just enter after that happens. What I now want to do is timestamp the next thing that, that I add in gonna be a note saying, you know, assigned to John Smith, for example. So that timestamp is coming from that extra date field that I have over here, this formatted field. So just right down here, I add the contents of that field. I can see formatted right down here. I can insert that. And then I want a space and I'm gonna say assign to, and then I wanna insert the name of the person that I link to. So that's John Smith from that link field. So I can, uh, with the cursor down there, it, it adds wherever you have the cursor currently placed. I can add this in here, continue. And I want that to be assigned to. Now it's a subcomponent of that thing because you might have multiple possible links in there. And there are different things you can add from that, that link field. I want to just add his name. So I got the name option right down here. I can just insert that and it says list of name. Now, if there was more than one link in there, it would list everybody in that space. But for a single link like this, it just lists as one name. So what I'm doing in here is I'm leaving the notes as they were originally set, copy those in intact, and then add and append to that the extra data that I wanna add in there. So the timestamp and then assign to so-and-so in here. Now, when I run this test, it should update this record here with the timestamp and that assigned note. So there we go, it adds that piece in. And now I can see it's assigned to John Smith on this date. So I can do the same thing. Now this is set up and working successfully. I can switch this on. If I want to, I can add more things like emailing the person and stuff like that. So all the same options you have in here for adding field contents are available then in uh, an email option, an email action for filling in their email address, their first name, the link to the record and things like that. But I'm gonna skip over that for now to keep this a little shorter. So with this turned on, uh, it's an active automation. So now I can do the same thing for these down here. I can assign this one, let's say Jason, and that one over to Alice. And then one by one, just say these are assigned and it'll get the detail. And now if nothing's in that field, it'll just append the note with the timestamp into the blank field. But obviously I've got a line break in there in case I did have things previously. So uh, a minor issue there if I don't have any notes. Um, but if I did have notes, those notes wouldn't be erased. They would just be appended to with that additional piece in there. So the basics of automation are really, really cool. Again, lots of different trigger options in there. Um, my favorite thing to do with automations is through scripting. Talking about what Kavon said earlier, um, I love writing a lot of scripts that do more detailed operations for automations, but you don't need to know scripting to do this kind of stuff. Uh, and there's a lot of really elaborate things you can do through the automation system as it currently stands. Uh, so that's where I'm gonna leave this for now and uh, see if anybody has any questions. So cool. Uh, <clears throat> we just get someone who's mentioning automations through, oh, what do you think the biggest, this is from Twitter, what do you think the biggest difference between automations here and, and Zapier or Zapier or, is, or Zappy? As someone um, I think the biggest difference right now is just how long automations in Airtable have been around and the available features in there. Mm -hmm. um, you don't have the, uh, the option of branching things like you do in Zapier and in Integromat also. Um, you don't have um, you know, some of the conditional things you have in there, but getting back to what I was kind of teasing about earlier, if I can get back to my slideshow over here, there I you noticed that was one of your questions earlier um, from uh, one of the developers at Airtable, who put a big long, they quoted uh, the Airtable um, Twitter account, quoted uh, his, or sent you a link to this guy's, a thread that he wrote, he's one of the developers at Airtable for the automation system. And this is the last post in his thread. There's a lot of work left to bring the powerful power functions, he calls them functions earlier on in his thread, into our low code world. Conditional logic, for loops, integration with external services, automations, calling other automations, and more to come soon. 
So they are working on trying to make automations in Airtable, not just the bare bones system it is now. They wanted to make, I think my own personal opinion is in theory, as robust as stuff like Zapier and Integromat and things along that line, where you can call lots of other external services and again, they do traditional logic to branch out and do different things, maybe stop the automation if a certain condition is met or have it go on if it's not. Um, Jane, stop this there. crazy it's thing. It's just in very Jane. early stages right now. Yeah, cool. Chris, this is amazing. Chris, can you, can you got more people? Do we got more level two? Well, we got me and we have Camille. Oh my goodness, okay. I'm, I'll, I'll run through mine really quick because it, uh, it, some of it Just, adds on. Uh, Justin, can you stop sharing? There you go. Thanks. Yep. Sorry about that. You're good. Uh, run through mine real quick because it kind of one part of it adds on to automations. Um, let me see here. Let me share my screen. So you're speaking next. Is this you now? Yes. Uh, track that's chair. Me. Okay. So I'll introduce you. Chris Guthrie speaking next. Uh, Chris is up here and he's going to be talking to us. If you checked out the website, there's one website with all this content for you. Buttons gateway to on-demand automation. And I'll tell you, Chris. Anyone who knows me will tell you I like to push some buttons. So let's, let's talk right. about this. Let's push them. Let's push them. So can everybody see my Google slide here? Yes, sir. All right. So buttons on demand. Uh, I like to use buttons all over my base. Well, let me back up. Um, I'm a full-time e-commerce seller. I primarily sell on Amazon, but I also consult and help other Amazon sellers uh, build their their products, their advertising, a whole bunch of different aspects. And for me and my virtual assistants, we use a Airtable for everything. We've actually, we, we're constantly trying to migrate away from other tools if we can and build in and centralize everything in Airtable. So I like to use a lot of buttons because something that Chris said earlier kind of stuck with me is automation sometimes just make mistakes happen faster. So there are some things like sending emails uh, especially like when we're sending out either requests for inspections or sending out invoices, uh, or I, I like, I want to proof those sometimes and see them before they just get sent out blindly. Mm -hmm. So I use buttons to send some really simple emails buttons. I'm not going to go through this, but this, these are some of the stock things that buttons can do that Airtable gives you, but I like to think outside and try to think of some different ways to use them. So, I actually just a couple weeks ago figured this out for myself was to use a button to send a very simple email using the mail to link syntax. And you can go out to Google and find a bunch of websites that show you the syntax on how to format a, a hyperlink so that it'll open up your default email program in your computer to send out an email. Uh, pros is that it's pretty, pretty easy to do this. You can even do this on a free account versus sending out emails through automations, you have to be on one of the upper tiers on Airtable. And, but the cons are is that it's gonna be a very simple email. There's no special formatting. You can't put attachments, but you can insert a public or the link to an attachment field or not, not the link to the field, but link to the attachment in the field, which is a public document. So be aware of that. So here uh, is just a little snapshot of a, of a demo base I created what we're doing is I have a field, it's a rich text field, and I'm formatting w using curly braces or whatever other method you wanna use uh, to call in other fields whenever we hit that send email button. And then on the send email button screen, we are substituting the, the data inside of those curly braces using formula to bring in the data, say a phone number or a name or any other piece of information that you need to bring into your email. So this is the hardest part of this process. You have to like format this formula correctly and you have to replace each, each of those variables individually in your, in your formula. But once you get the hang of it, it's actually really easy. So I'll demo that for you real quick here. It, I have uh, I have a name. I have the email address. This is going to go out to phone number, email subject, the body of the email. And if I hit send email button, let me bring this over. It just formats a really simple email that you can send out 
and we personally use it for like uh, requesting inspections and requesting freight quotes from our freight from our freight forwarders. I want to be able to proof this and this allows me to edit this email also if there's just like a PS I want to throw in there or uh, do I want to drag in an attachment or something like that. But this is a real time saver because we have this on some of our emails we're sending out we're using roll up fields to collect different information about shipments and a whole bunch of other fun stuff. So that's number one, just uh, one way that we use buttons. And then number two is, um, I, I give a shout out to Justin. I actually learned how to do this through one of his community posts. And uh, thank you to so many other people too. Uh, you know, I've, I've learned so much through the community and uh, have built techniques that I'm using currently. So we can also instant use a button as an on-demand trigger to an outside service. Most commonly that would be Zapier or um, Zapier or Integromat. So we're using a simple web hook and this allows us to initiate an action over on Zapier or Integromat instantly instead of waiting either for a time integrate or a, um, a time period or for an event to happen in order to, to have the rest of that automation on Zapier and Integromat run through its course. Mm. And we are doing that with a, a button URL and then you could also do it with a script that gets a little bit more advanced. You have to, you have to know very basic JavaScript, but what's cool about initiating the webhook through, through a script is you can do some pre, pre and post processing of your data that you're going to be sending out. And this really helps with like Integromat because Integromat syncs on, syncs on time intervals. With this, you don't have to wait for that time interval and you don't waste different Integromat cycles because say you want something on Integromat to check every 15 minutes, they're going to count that as one cycle and take it away from your balance. So what is a webhook? And it's, to me, the way I think of it is a, is a URL or a, a, I'm sorry, a, a hyperlink or whatever that sends out data to that other service. So Integ or Integromat gives us the core part of the webhook. They give you a unique webhook ID. And then in this purple section here, you can see that this is what we're telling Integromat this data piece should be called. And then right here in the Airtable formula, this is the actual piece of information we're sending through the webhook. So in this case, the record ID. I'm not gonna show this in detail, but these are some of the basic steps on how to set up a very basic Integromat trigger. The webhook receives the data. We're going back out to Airtable to grab some other information. I'm running, creating a quick variable in this purple step and then updating that same trigger record in, back in Airtable. So I can demo that and in, its, in the easiest form, I do this with the send URL button. And so if you watch here, I have in this column, send to Integromat, I have the word amazing. And if I hit the button, it does open up a link and it, Integromat tells you, okay, we accepted that, you can close that. And then what my automation did was just append the word amazing to Airtable is am and make Airtable is amazing. I can click that again. And then now that field is also updated. Again, you can do that with scripts. I'm not going to get into that because we're running short on time. And I will share this base. Um, and I'll make sure we'll make sure that Chris can share out this link to anybody. I have a demo base and I have some explanations in that demo base that can walk you through editing a script or editing the formula for yourself. That's so great, Chris. Chris, it's funny. I was I, All the slides and all of the examples along with all the prizes are out on the website. And for the prizes, we'll be selecting people random for who were here today. I'd like to say we picked the people who chatted the most, but that would not be fair. <laughs> so if you're interested in any of the bases, uh, and also since we're still successfully streaming live, hopefully this will be out on the internet forever. Uh, Chris, do you have more folks for us? We do, we have Camille and she's gonna Wait, show us. The Camille? Yes, the, the. There, the. Were, there were people fan, fan, fan persing for Camille earlier. Caller, are you with us? 
Camille, are you here with us? Caller, caller. I saw her earlier. Oh, hi. I was on mute. Sorry. All right. Um, hello. Um, thank you so. for all the appreciation, chat. <laughs> um, my name is Camille Parks. I am a lot of different things. I wanted to start my session with like, Excuse Agreed. me, Camille. Chris, Chris, can you stop sharing for a minute? Oh, yeah. Sorry about that. You're totally good. You're totally good. I mean, if people have Camille t-shirts on, you got to at least have like a little Camille on the screen. <laughs> Thank you. There Camille. you go. I have an Airtable t-shirt on and yeah. I'm also just out of frame. I have Airtable socks. It's real. My, my oh, wait, a minute. let me see that again. I got to get that screenshot. Yeah, go ahead. I, I got it. Okay. That's yes. good. The ch the chat is like socks. Yes, I have Airtable socks. Um, so I'm many different things. I wanted to start my session with a little brief, not life story, but life trajectory, just so I can get people to not be as afraid of custom blocks as they might be. Um, that's what my session is about, or, or custom apps. They changed the terminology on us on Monday, so forgive me. Um, how are we on time? Totally good. We've got time built on the end, so you can go over a little bit. Great. We're going to get crazy. Um, okay. So I'm going to share my screen. So uh, let me see one more uh, thing. Uh, Hold on one more yes. thing. Track three, hang in there. Track three, hang in there. You're coming up. Thank you, Camille. Go ahead. Okay. Um, so We've mentioned Built on Air, the podcast and the community um, in the previous sessions. I want to reiterate, um, I am one of the hosts for the podcast Built on Air. Our other host, Ali Alosa, is actually in the chat. Um, and we have interviewed so many great um, people in the Airtable community. In fact, many of them are here. We interviewed Chris Dancy. Um, we've interviewed Gareth. Um, Kavan and Justin, they've all been on the podcast, all excellent guests. And if you want to know um, how people are actually using Airtable, each episode of the podcast goes into detail of one particular use case um, for how someone has used Airtable. So just giving that as a shout out. Um, I'm also a community leader on the Airtable forums. So you may or may not have seen me. I'm practically everywhere. <laughs> um, I'm there a lot and I answer a lot of questions. Um, but what I want to get out of this session is I am not a developer by trade. In fact, the great irony of my life is um, I was admitted to undergrad under the um, major of computer science and I dropped it the first day of orientation. I didn't even get to the school year. I was like, ah, oh, this isn't for me. And then I became an urban designer, which I love. And just looking at this one page from my portfolio, database developer is like the third thing um, that I do. But nevertheless, earlier this year when custom blocks now called custom apps became a thing, there was a contest um, that was put out and I wanted to dip my toe in. Um, I had some ideas and I wanted, I wanted to build something and the custom apps API is actually, it's not so scary once you jump in. And um, I, I, I was just obsessed with producing um, one particular idea. Um, I do want to shout out Kavan. She didn't mention during her sec, uh, session, but she was also one of the other winners. Just shout outs. Um, everyone did such great things um, for this contest and all of them are open source, meaning you can install any of the 100 um, custom apps that were made for this contest yourself, um, even the ones that didn't win. And some of them are excellent. So, um, Going forward, I'm going to talk to you about the custom app that I made called Scheduler. It's actually available on the marketplace now. Um, right now, installing custom apps that aren't on the marketplace, there's a bit of, you have to go through a bit of rigmarole to get, to get them into your base. There's instructions on how to do it, but there's some setup that you have to do ahead of time. Scheduler is one of the ones that you can install straight from the marketplace, just like Page Designer or 
the dedupe app. You can install it straight away. And I'm going to talk to you guys about how scheduler came to be and how it works. And hopefully I don't run into any bugs. Um, just very quickly, there is um, airtable.com slash developer slash blocks. If you want to jump in, there's examples, there's um, this API reference, so you could look at all of the different components that you can add to a custom block. If you decide you wanna dip your toe in and build something yourself, start to build something yourself, I highly, highly, highly encourage you to do so. Um, just as a side thing, um, to you know, gain a new skill, Obviously, I'm obsessed with, with building things, and so I want to push my obsession on everyone else. Um, so what we are now looking at is a pretty basic Airtable base. I have a table full of rooms, uh, conference rooms. It could be hotel rooms. You could do something very, very similar with library books, or if you rent things out and you want to, um, you want something to be um, kept for a start date and an end date and you don't want people to overbook or have overlapping bookings for something, that's what we're getting at with scheduler. Um, and so I have a table full of reservations. So Studio A was rented from the 11th all the way to the 14th or something. Um, and then people. So who are renting out these rooms? Pretty basic um, structure. And I had, before the contest, I had built the same functionality as a script um, using the scripting block, now called scripting app. Um, so what you would do is you would first select a person and then you would type in a date and then you would type in an end date and then you would pick a room that, was, that happened to be available during that time. And then if you wanted to add another one, you could, but I felt limited by that implementation, right? Because you would have to type in the date in a particular format in order for the script to read it properly. It wasn't really intuitive. Um, the way the scripting app works is you have to do things in sequence one at a time. So if I wanted to go back and change the 19th to some other date, I would have to stop and then start over. And so I had in my head, I've already figured out the, the process that I want this to take. How do I turn that into an app? And I eventually got to the point where um, I came up with scheduler. And I, I knew it would work so much better if you could just click and drag dates on a calendar, because that's the most user intuitive way to work with dates, right? I don't want people to have to type in a date exactly right. I want people to go back and change dates if they want. I wanna make sure people can reserve more than one thing at a time if they want to. And um, luckily I was able to figure it out. So just a quick demo, if I select North Conference Room and Studio A, this will update and show me all of the reservations for those two, um, resources at the same time. And I can click and drag any of the dates that aren't occupied. And if I click um, reserve these two resources, you'll see that a new record has been added to the calendar interface and it pops up. Um, so if I wanted to go in and add um, a customer, I, I could. Um, and if I tried to select a date that has something already occupying it, it won't let me. I don't know if you guys can see the, the cancel um, icon that comes up, but uh, it won't let you select a date that already has a reservation for it. And um, in addition, if you wanted to view things in full screen, I've allowed that um, by adding the plus and minus button at the top. So you don't have to select from the grid view. You can um, just incrementally add things by clicking um, clicking and removing as such, right? So again, pretty, pretty simple in terms of how you would use it in your day-to-day. -day. Um, and then the settings are also pretty simple as well. Um, this is probably the least 
favorite user interface for settings that I've developed since the contest. I have made a couple other custom apps that I'm really proud of, with ha which have much cuter settings than this. Um, but it gets the job done. Um, simple change if I wanted to show all the records is, you know, orange, I can. So um, it was mentioned in the chat earlier that you don't have to build absolutely everything from scratch when you're building a custom app. Um, I didn't sit here and design the calendar interface. It actually uses um, something called fullcalendar.io. You'll notice it looks very, very similar. Uh, I was able to basically just import the functionality of full calendar and then add just a little bit of code on top of it in order to come up with what eventually became scheduler and um it's while it works and i haven't run into any bugs um i don't think they would have allowed it on the marketplace if it had bugs they might have i don't know i hope not um but if if a professional coder were to look at scheduler they would probably go why is everything in a single javascript file why didn't she break it out into different sections. And I say that just to hopefully provide comfort to people that although I was able to make something that was successful, I'm still learning. And, you know, the sky is really the limit for what you can build in a custom app. And um, it really is just a function of trial and error, coming up with an idea that you really, really, really want to make um, or have made for you. There are so many developers out there who specialize in Airtable who would be more than happy to build a custom app for you. Um, it's just really nice to know the realm of possibility. Um, you'll be a better client, so you'll be able to say with uh, much more certainty, this is what I want because I know it's possible. Um, and that's why I really want people to go out and try it. And we also mentioned earlier um, in the conference that, you know, you, you draw out your plan. I, I have a sheet of paper where I've drawn out the, my preferred user interface for another block that I'm building. And um, depending on time, I can show one that I'm still currently developing. Um, but I will stop so I don't run over and address any questions if there are any. You're, you're good. You're good. We're good. We'll get well, track three is all of our skilled professionals. So they'll be a little bit uh, patient with us. You want to show us your drawing or? Um, yeah. So I don't know how well it's going to come across. I'm currently building a. Stop, stop. If you stop sharing your screen, you'll take full screen. Your picture will. Well, I mean, I can just show what it is because okay. it's, it's mostly there. I'm building an, in, an invoicer and it's not production ready and it probably won't be for another like two months so don't get your hopes up but i'm close and um basically what i wanted wow was, just wait there's more because i've gone crazy and it's taken over my life so i wanted people to be able to move beyond page designer um where you could only look at an invoice, but you couldn't add to it. You'd have to go back and open up the record and add things. And the, the issue with invoices is this, it's a classic use case for what's called a junction table, where you don't link products to the invoice, you link products to a line item. Yep. And then the line item is linked to an invoice, right? Yep, I tried to get Gareth, I tried to pay Gareth to build this for me and ended up trying to do it myself. Well, um, I am open to collaboration because <laughs> this is an absolute beast. It's probably going to be the most complicated thing I've ever built, but I'm so proud of where it is now, where you can select any of the products, right? Wow. Add a quantity, click add, and it'll appear wow. at the bottom. All your fields will update. If you wanted to edit the invoice itself, there's a pop-up that comes up and I could change the status from shipping to received. And eventually wow. I wanted to print. This is all, and this for the record, does not have any external libraries. It's not like scheduler, which uses a package like full calendar. This is all Airtable, all Airtable apps um, API. I have not added anything special to it 
yet. I want to add something for PDFs. Um, wow. But this is just to like wet your whistle for mm. what's possible for someone to make. Again, this was trial and error. This was me getting a sheet of notebook paper and then drawing out, okay, this is relatively, this is how big I want that box to be and, and all that kind of stuff. And again, this is probably going to be the next two months of my life, like perfecting this, but I want people to know this is a brand new thing for Airtable, custom apps, and even the scripting app is new. All of this is 2020 release stuff, and you're already able to do this kind of stuff, if that makes sense. Um, amazing. This is amazing. So, you know, I, I don't know about anybody else, but I don't want Airtable socks. I want Camille socks. No, you don't. You don't. Oh, want come that. on. This is too good. This is too good. This is probably the highlight of my day. I, I love good bass. You give good bass. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I just, I, I want people to not feel like, oh, I'm not a developer. I can't build this. My, uh, no, 40 hours a week, I'm an urban planner. And then I also just learned JavaScript myself. I'm self-taught and trial and error. It nev you never stop learning. And eventually you'll get to a point where you will have an idea for something and you'll have just enough skill set to fumble your way through it because I'm still fumbling constantly. Yeah. Um, but it's amazing. You know, amazing. There you go. Wow. Uh, Chris, Camille, uh, Kavan. I mean, we've had so many people on track two here. Uh, track two is like, it's taken on a life of its own right now, I think. But uh, th thank you so much, uh, Chris and uh, Kavan, for doing that. We are, uh, Chris, are we done with track two? Yes? Yeah, that's it. So let's Woo! wrap it up. And that was, that was a, a great encore there. <laughs>